All right, guys, chapter 13 deals with repressed memories and novel syndromes. So in 1943, Leo Kanner first identified autism, and he suggested that it was caused by a lack of maternal warmth, by mothers who are obsessive and mechanical in the way they relate to their children. Later on, someone referred to these mothers as refrigerator moms. <clears throat> All of this, however, is based on unsupported theories and psychoanalytical concepts that didn't have any scientific or empirical validation. So false memories are memories that are a distortion of either an actual event or a confabulation of an imagined one. So they involve confusing or mixing fragments of different memories. And some may have happened at different times, but are remembered as occurring together, whereas some are errors in our source memory. Some also involve treating dreams as if they were playbacks of real experiences. And some are the result of therapists prodding, leading, and suggesting. Confabulation is fantasy that has unconsciously emerged as a factual account in our memory. It could be partly based on fact or a complete construction of the imagination. Source memory involves a memory that is accurate and often detailed, except we've mistaken the source of it. So a person has retained the facts but forgotten the source. And this is also called source amnesia or memory misattribution. Battered women syndrome was discovered, um, or rather learned helplessness, which is a part of outer women syndrome. It's discovered in 1967 while some researchers are looking at classical conditioning using dogs. Um, dogs were placed in harnesses so they could not escape and then presented with small electric shocks. And they noticed a distinct difference between dogs who had been harnessed and the control group who was not. Those who had not, when they were presented with a shock, jumped and tried to escape. Those who show distress but failed to escape the shock in, shock in the first experiment, then in a later experiment, um, didn't even try to escape the shock. <clears throat> and this shows that our previous learning can result in drastic changes in behavior. Now, they tested this with humans using instead a loud, irritating noise. So there were two groups of people. They're both exposed to a loud, irritating noise and told that if they solve a puzzle, the noise will be shut off. One group, their puzzle had no solution. So no matter what, they weren't able to shut off that noise. Then they were presented with similar situations, but with a new puzzle. That puzzle did have a solution, but the group who had been in the, the prior group that had had no solution did significantly worse. So basically we can learn to be helpless in an environment, even if it does offer us control. So better women syndrome is introduced by Lenore Walker, and she is interviewing victims of domestic violence in Colorado from 1978 to 1981. And she identifies key sociological and psychological factors that make up this proposed syndrome. And she basically identifies three stages in battering. First, there's the tension building stage. This is where there are minor verbal and battering incidents. They begin to increase in both frequency and severity and the strategies that the victims had prior used in the past to placate their batterers start, stop working. <clears throat> the feelings of responsibility on the part of the women, um, or rather the women start to feel responsible because they can't control the batterer's behavior. Then that tension is released in an acute battering stage, which either has an acute incident or several incidents. This is uncontrollable rage and destructiveness and that rage is sometimes triggered by an external event or the internal state of the batterer. The acute incident is briefer in duration than the other two stages. And then we have the contrite and loving behavior stage. This is a period of unusual calm in which the batterer tries to make up for their behavior. It's often called the honeymoon stage. They admit that they were wrong and apologize and swear they'll never do it again. They try to win back the victim and the victim eventually capitulates and this strengthens their bond. Now, originally when trying to use this defense in court with women who eventually killed their batterer, the original defense was not guilty by reason of insanity, basically arguing PTSD. <clears throat> but many felt this caused a stigma that resulted in psychiatric commitment. So the defense shifted to self-defense, but with essentially a lower threshold for that self-defense. Now, many states do not actually allow you to argue then that that is a valid lower threshold. So this syndrome is often introduced by experts 
And it may be done to counter any type of stereotypical views that a juror may have about battered women. And by 1993, this had been argued and accepted in all courts. So while this is not presented um, as a means of allowing an expert to testify um, about a defendant's state of mind at the time of the killing, when they when you don't use this excuse, the, the defendant is always convicted. But in about a third of cases where it was used, the defendant was actually acquitted. Now, the effects of battering have been studied in a variety of ways. National surveys are trying to document how common this is. They do that with large representative samples that allow us to generalize to the public. Whereas clinical interviews provide a lot of details about experiences, but those experiences are not necessarily typical of every woman who is battered. Not every woman who is battered has any long-term, um, sorry, not all people who have been battered over a long period of time experience battered women syndrome or learned helplessness. So this raises questions then about the validity with which this syndrome can be identified. Now, there's definitely problems with research on this topic as well. A lot of times there aren't any proper control groups or appropriate statistical tests. And they often fail to guard against any bias by the researcher. Also, we know that there are women who do take action successfully to end their abuse. Now, what about insanity or self-defense, which should we argue? Whether to base battered women's syndrome on insanity or self-defense has important implications. They each have different requirements, implications in terms of what would happen to you under the law, and consequences. So insanity is an excuse where the offender is unable to distinguish between right and wrong, whereas self-defense is a justification. Now, in State v. Norman, um, the defendant killed her husband who had beaten her for years, but she killed him while he lay sleeping, so her claim of self-defense failed. Now, rape trauma syndrome is essentially a form of PTSD that is experienced by rape victims, and this term is coined in 1974. It refers to the acute phase and long-term reorganization process that occurs as a result of a forcible rape or attempted forcible rape. And these two phases are identified um, by Burgess and Holstrom, who studied 92 patients who went to the ER at Boston City Hospital over a one-year period. The acute phase lasts for several weeks after the rape, and this includes physical trauma from the rape, skeletal muscle tension manifesting in headaches, sleep disturbances, and an elevated startle reaction, gastrointestinal disturbances, and intense fear and blame. Now, the long-term phase is where initially there's some disorganization and the victim needs to go through a reorganization process. Increased activity um, in terms of motor functions, nightmares, phobic reactions to circumstances similar to the rape, and fear of being alone or in crowds. Now, evidence of rape trauma syndrome may be used in trial to put that victim's actions into context. So again, just as with battered women's syndrome, um, jurors and the general public have some expectations of how someone would um, behave if they had been sexually assaulted. And those are not necessarily accurate expectations. So any behavior that may seem inconsistent with expected behavior can often be explained if an expert talks about what rape trauma syndrome is. So it could be introduced to support the prosecution's contention that the victim did not consent or show that intercourse did take place and has been offered by the defense to show that if a victim had been assaulted, she would exhibit symptoms of RTS. So technically this isn't allowed to be offered as substantive evidence, but some state decisions do seem to support that. So a Maryland Supreme Court held in 1986 that it wasn't an abuse of discretion to admit testimony of an expert who testified about PTSD and his belief that the witness suffered from PTSD as a result of the rape in question. Now, a 1992 review of case law found that there is a common concern in recognizing a single syndrome that's going to cover this broad range of symptoms and responses. And this has similar issues um, in terms of the research around rape trauma syndrome as battered, win battered women's syndrome research has. There's a lack of control groups. Um, problems with the size of the sample and the characteristics of the sample. Failure, failure to operationalize important definitions and concepts. Potential selection bias. Inconsistent interviewing methods. 
an inadequate long-term follow-up of victims. So just as with battered women syndrome, these characteristics are not universal in all rape victims, and it cannot be validated as a definitive sign that a rape did or did not occur. Now, automatism is an absolute defense in Great Britain because no act is punishable if done involuntarily. So automatism refers to an act that's done by the muscles without any control of the mind. So this could include a spasm, a reflexive action, or a convulsion. It also incur includes behavior that happens while suffering from a concussion or while sleepwalking. Now, we know that every crime except strict liability crimes requires both an actus reus and a mens rea. So automatism negates that actus reus, the voluntary act. So automatism basically recognizes that some criminal acts may be committed involuntarily, even though no third party is involved. Now, in People v. Liznow, a Vietnam vet who struck a maitre d' in a restaurant for no apparent reason, then went into the parking lot and engaged in other acts of violence while in a dreamlike state. The court held that he was entitled to a defense of automatism. Now, medical conditions can also cause um, behavior that may not be considered criminal. So uh, a seizure, hypoglycemia, or a severe head injury. But you have to show that the disability had not previously been experienced. So if it's the first time you have a seizure, that would be excusable under the law. However, once you've been diagnosed with that, if you've been told not to drive by your doctor and you get behind the wheel of a car, have a seizure and cause an accident, um, that would not be allowable. That would not be admitted into court. Um, you basically have to be able to show that it wasn't possible for you to take any reasonable steps to prevent the, prevent the criminal behavior. Now, there's also factitious disorders. So Munchausen syndrome is where a patient fabricates or induces his own symptoms and presents himself for treatment. Um, Munchausen by proxy syndrome first appears in 1977, and it uses a child as a proxy. So these factitious disorders were introduced in the DSM-3 in 1980, and there are warning signs of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Basically, persistent and recurrent illnesses for which there is no cause to be found, discrepancies between the patient's medical history and clinical findings, signs and symptoms that do not occur if the child is away from the mother, unusual or bizarre symptoms, failure of the child to respond to treatment despite repeated hospitalizations, and frequent comparison of the child's medical problems to those of the parents. The offender in these cases is often the mother with the victim often being the child. But there are only a small number of controlled studies, so we have yet to establish any empirical basis for this. And those are often based on clinical observations. Now, it is possible that the child is experiencing some chronic illness um, and that a parent could be unjustly accused. Now, in 1995, a man named Schmitz appears on the Jenny Jones show to reveal his secret crush on another man. Um, that man then was, Schmitz was then, uh, sorry, Schmitz appears on the show. Another man reveals his secret crush on him. Schmitz is embarrassed and humiliated. And three days later, he shoots um, Emma Dure, who is the man who revealed the secret crush. Calls 911 and confesses. He argues gay panic as a defense. This me, he basically says that he is so humiliated um, as being identified by Amadori as the object of his homosexual crush that it drove him to kill. And the jury did sympathize with him and convict him of a lesser offense of second degree murder. Now, gay panic is first described in 1920 by Dr. Kempf as an intense form of anxiety, tense tension and rage experienced by a person with latent homosexual tendencies and brought about by the mere presence or sight of homosexuals. Now, these people are usually precariously psychologically balanced and have fragile egos. Gay panic is not in the DSM, so it doesn't constitute a mental illness for insanity, and it doesn't allow for a defense of self-defense or provocation because those are both based on um, the behavior expected of a reasonable person. In fact, these crimes are better classified as hate crimes. Black rage is, de, uh, is argued as a defense first in 1925 in the case of Ossian Sweet. Now, he couldn't argue self-defense because um, he fired before the crowd attacked him. But they were able to introduce a history of white mobs beating and killing black people, and the jury did acquit him. But this hasn't really found any success beyond this case because you have to establish a concrete interplay in your particular situation. 
Now, in People v. Ferguson, Ferguson um, is on the commuter rail, the Long Island Railroad, and he shoots and kills six people. Um, he did not actually end up arguing any type of rage because he fired his attorney and argued that he wasn't even the offender. In 1994, Baez opened fire on a group of Jewish children, and he argued early Arab trauma because he spent the first 18 years of his life in Lebanon and could not be held responsible for his murders because of the psychological scarring he had received during those years. He was sentenced to 141 years in prison. Now, road rage is the impulsive violent behavior committed against people whose driving incurs the wrath of the perpetrator. This is often looked at more in terms of displaced aggression. So this occurs when a person is provoked, is unwilling or unable to retaliate against the original provocateur, and subsequently aggresses against a seemingly innocent target. Now, research does support that displaced aggression is related to behavioral inhibition. So basically, inhibited people are punishment aversive. And when confronted with a provocation, anyone who inhibits their feelings is likely to um, initially inhibit that desire to retaliate. But they continue to dwell, get angry, and plot revenge. And they may then, when provoked, um, take that anger out on someone else. But this is not any type of um, formal diagnosis. It's really just describing a particular type of behavior. Now, um, sexual addiction syndrome is the compulsive need to engage in sexual behavior or become sexually aroused. And it's often viewed as encompassing excess excessive behavior, failed efforts to reduce that behavior, and interference, that behavior interfering with um, basically your daily life, even though you know it's detrimental. Now, Golden Hefner note that the research is in this, um, in regards to sexual addiction, is largely based on clinical observations. So because there isn't any research, decent research supporting this, it probably wouldn't meet any legal standards for admissibility. So there's no valid or reliable studies right now that can effectively distinguish this from other disorders. <clears throat> now, in 1996, Romaldi tried to use this as a defense to child pornography. And the psychologist stated that jail time would be counterproductive for the defendant because it would increase his sense of psychological isolation. And the psychologist recommended probation and group therapy. Now, in this case, he hadn't actually engaged in any sexual contact with children. So this really points to a diagnosis of a paraphilia as opposed to sexual addiction. Addiction. One thing this case did do is clarify that expert testimony has to be based on recognized diagnoses. Now, Stame now has argued that just because a person repeatedly chooses a certain behavior doesn't mean it's an addiction. Now, in terms of sex offenses, there's increasing excitement during every phase. This begins with initi initially fantasizing about the act, pursuing the object, commission of the act, and then the aftermath. Now, some offenders experience pangs of regret, but it does not deter them. People make choices about how they behave sexually and they're not necessarily suffering from a disease or addiction. So the best way to, enter, to deal with this is to try to get it not admitted in the first place through the rules of evidence, but you can also do it through thorough cross-examination of the expert and their qualifications. And that wraps up this chapter. Um, and as I'm lecturing, I'm noticing because I kind of wrote these pretty quickly, uh, there's a ton of typos, so I'm going to extend that extra credit that was previously offered. You can earn up to one point. You can earn one point for each typo that you send me. You need to tell me which slide number it's on, um, and you can earn up to 10 points on the next exam, which would be exam four. Um, I need these, though, by our next class.